Welcome back, everyone. I am the Bad Luck Gamer, and this is a type of video I don't typically do because a core bit of my audience are already playing Pathfinder 2nd Edition. But for those of you who are my fans who do play the game and you want to show someone else the basics of the game so they can easily hop in, I recommend sharing this video as much as you can as it's going to help a lot of people learn how to play the game. And for those of you who are trying to learn how to play Pathfinder 2nd Edition, this video is going to be a bare basics how to play the game, not necessarily how to set up your character sheets or all that kind of stuff. This is just going to be the bare basics. So you know that when you hop into a battle for the first time in your game, generally what you need to do. And I will explain some other like core concepts and I'll give you guys some tips and tricks in the video as well. So th just re remember that this video is not a complete guide to combat. This game is incredibly dynamic and very tactical, and there's a lot of nuance and depth to the rules. But the things I'm going to be showing you today are things anyone can do, and they take a very minimal amount of knowledge to pull off, as all it is is just generally where you're standing and positioning. So that being the case, let's go ahead and get down to the basics. So when you start a combat encounter, you're going to have three actions. So three actions count for anything that you do. So moving, for instance, would be an action. Attacking would be an action. And if you're coming over from D&D 5e, you don't have a, a limit on the number of times you can attack other than the number of actions you have. So if you really wanted to, you could attack three times in a round at level one, which is pretty big. Now, obviously, that might not necessarily be the best thing to do, as this is a much more tactical game and it takes a lot more situations into account. But let's go ahead and get to the very basic element of movement. So we have these drow fighters here. They have a movement of 30. You can see with the little feet here. I'm using Foundry for this, by the way. And this is not a sponsored video by Foundry, but I found Foundry was the best way I could visually represent to you guys how much or like how the game works with visual aids. So hopefully this helps out. And hey, if Foundry wants to give me a sponsorship, I'll take that too. Uh, but anyway, so the Drow Fighter here has 30 feet. Each square in the game counts as five feet. So if we move this guy here, we'll actually get to see. So this is five feet, 10 feet, 15 feet, 20 feet, and 30 feet. So this is as much as they can move in a single action. If we move more than that, it turns yellow. That means that that is not, you can't move there without spending an additional action. But Pathfinder 2E also uses the square circle rule. And what this means is when you move diagonally, you'll see here, here's five. But now it's suddenly 15 feet and then it's 20 and then it's 30. But there's only four hexes here where the other way it was six, not hexes, squares. So this is how the square rule works. Every diagonal you move will alternate between five and 10 feet. This is because in math, diagonals on a square are like one and a quarter or something along those lines to make it easier for the game's reference. This is this just represents a, a 5105 rule. So another way we can easily visualize our movement is all we need to do is take the circle tool and we can move it out here to 30 feet and bam, all illuminated hexes that you can see here on the map are places we can move with a single action. When you lay it out like this, we actually have a fair amount of movement that we can do. Now, obviously, it doesn't have to necessarily be in a straight line. For instance, if we wanted to try to move around our, our friend over here in the corner, then we would have 5, 10, 15, or sorry, uh, 20 because we're moving diagonal. And then we wanted to get behind them we have, this would be 25, and then this would be 30, because that would be one more diagonal. So this is actually 30 feet to move all around here. So let's say we do, we, we have Giving Drow here, who is going to move up to Philosophical Drow, and he's going to kill him, because 
<coughs> they disagree on the fundamentals of life. So, how does this work? Well, he's going to attack him, obviously. And we can see here the little armor symbol. He has 18 AC. So, our guy is going to make a strike with his rapier. And we can see here is plus 9 to hit. Bam. He's going to strike. He rolled a 3. Uh, that's going to be a miss as we got a 12 and his AC is 18. Very, very unfortunate. So you might be like, okay, I want to attack again. Well, if we look at our strikes up here, we'll see that there's a plus 4 rather than plus 9. And when we attack, we're going to have a less likely chance to hit. But we still managed to hit. Actually, just <coughs> barely. Now, we can see here on the side that we have a multiple attack penalty. This is known as MAP. The multi-attack penalty is to prevent characters from just sitting and doing nothing but attacking as the primary action. Now, your second attack was still a plus four, and on a D20 to get an 18, you would need to roll a 14 or higher, still likely, but not as likely as when we first made a strike. When we first striked him, we just needed to roll a what an 11 no a 9 or higher which gave us more than a 50% chance to strike and very typically every time you make a multi attack penalty it reduces your chance to hit by 25%. If we had an additional action for instance this round we could try striking again but this one's at minus 1. As you can see here our multi attack penalty jumped on our third attack to minus 10 and obviously we did we rolled a 15 which is very good and would have hit any other time but because we we're on our third attack that it was just going to miss so doing multiple attacks in the same round is not necessarily a good thing but you'll be like hey blg didn't you say hey it's so cool that i could attack three times it is it is really cool that you could attack three times at the beginning of the game and sometimes this works sometimes you're going up against an enemy that is in a very disadvantageous position or maybe you're going up against a bunch of low level mook enemies who are trying to get in your way and every strike you make is devastating speaking on devastating actually let's go ahead and talk about criticals so criticals in the game let's see if i can let's see if i can naturally roll one here Well, I'm like eight rolls in and I rolled a critical miss here, but let's talk about critical misses. So in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, there's actually no negative repercussions for a critical fail unless a ability or thing states so. So a critical miss happens when you either roll a, a one on the dice, which is pretty normal if you're familiar with D20 systems, or you're rolling at a, a 10 under the enemy's AC. So we can see here that we got a result of 10. That means even rolling the lowest roll we could get, we actually can't critically miss just on skill alone. When you critically miss, nothing happens. So you don't have to worry about dropping your weapon suddenly, unless that's the way your GM wants to play the game. But just know that that is not how the rules are written. You're not designed to drop your weapon when you fail a check, especially because that can be very devastating in this game as action economy is king. But let's see how many rolls it takes for me to get a nat or 20 or a critical strike. All right, so despite rolling a nat one again in a row, I'm really living up to my name today, aren't I? We have a nat 20 here. So I rolled a 20 and we add a 9. This would be 29. Now, this is actually not the only result that would have netted a critical. As similar with the critical miss as I talked before, if you roll 10 over their AC, so if I had rolled a 19, then it would have been a critical because we got, would have got a 28 and their AC is 18. So on a critical hit, you double the damage that you roll. So if I roll the critical damage here, 
it rolls our damage die, which is a D6. It did not roll two D6. It rolls our damage die, which is a D6, which if we break it down here, we got a four. And the Drow Fighter here has a strength of plus two. So we actually add that to the die we roll and then we double it. So that would be a 12. Then this particular weapon has the deadly trait, as many weapons in the game do have some very cool things. But if you have a deadly weapon, this adds an additional D8 after you double. So the math is actually up here. Two times a D6 plus two plus a D8. So we rolled a two on the D8, netting a, a total of 14 damage. So <coughs> overall, not terrible. Not really great crit, but a pretty substantial amount of damage. And yeah, so this is the basics of hitting an enemy and multi-attacks. But there's a way to make this even easier by using teamwork. So I'm going to go up here and I'm going to pull up another drow friend we have. This is Vapid Drow. He absolutely hates philosophical drow because he thinks he's just a pompous asshole. And now they are flanking. So when an enemy is flanked, they're going to have... Oh, I actually have a keybind for this. The They're going to make you off guard. When you're off guard, your AC drops by two. You can see the little helmet here. Now you now have a 16. So while they're while they're flanking, giving drow is going to make another strike on his next turn. And he's going to roll a two. And that's a miss. Super unfortunate. So he decides, oh, I'm going to strike again. As long as I don't roll another two. There we go. So this one was a 19. So even on the second strike, I still had a pretty substantial chance. As I add plus four and their AC is currently 16, I just needed a 12 or higher. So a 40% chance to hit him on the third or on the second strike. And so that was indeed a hit. Just by having an ally here, our chances of hitting this guy skyrocketed. On our base hit, we just needed to roll a seven or higher, which is really good. And on our second one, we just needed to roll a six. And for our third one, it would be <coughs> somewhat hard, but we it would still be better than it was before. Uh, before the, the penalty, they would need to roll a 19, but now we only need to roll a 17. And something I did forget to mention as well. Uh, our drow have a main gauche, which is a dagger weapon. Now you can see here that they have different numbers. So if I roll the second attack here, we can see a little bit more. So this weapon is an agile weapon. You can see it has the agile trait. This means that the second attack is only at minus four and the third attack is only at minus eight. So if you were to strike this enemy, and you wanted to optimize your chance to hit, you would use your main rapier in one hand to strike the enemy. You would have, you know, your highest ability to do damage is actually another critical on a 19, which was really good. Or was that a 19? That doesn't seem like it would be 19, no, 17. So on a 17, really, really good. And because their AC got dropped, we can actually see here that this is a critical by 10 plus which is really cool. It even says here by 10 plus. On our second attack, rather than striking with the rapier again, we could strike then with our main gush, which does add a, a lesser failure chance. And we still missed, but if this was our rapier, we would have missed by even more. So this is the core of the game's kind of math. You want to optimize your chance to hit and doing so just by positioning is easier. Now, what is considered flanking? Anytime you are directly, you can draw a line from yourself to an ally that goes from one side to the opposite side or opposite corner counts as flanking. So if we were, in, for instance, in this configuration, this also is considered flanking. Now, if our vapid drow friend here was here, that's not flanking, or if they were here, this is not flanking. So, and I'll draw a square here because it's the easiest way to kind of show a representation. So we can see here that anytime you draw a line through any corners or the like, as long as it goes from one side to the opposite side, this counts as flanking. But 
if we go against a enemy that is bigger, for instance, go away, please. Let's say a large enemy who is a two by two. Then we can see here that flanking can be done from different positions. So for instance, you can flank from this position or this position or inverse. But I will say if you do corners, there's only one viable configuration. So to bring our tokens here to make it a little bit easier to see, this is considered flanking and this is considered flanking. And this is considered flanking, but this is no longer considered flanking as we cannot draw from one corner to the opposite corner. So when you're fighting a large or even larger enemy, Fighting from the corners is the most disadvantageous thing you can do as it reduces the areas in which your allies can flank the enemy. So that being the case, that's just a, another helpful tip here when it comes to using your martial weapons. But let's go ahead and talk about range weapons. So range weapons are a little bit different. So with a range weapon, you cannot benefit from flanking even if you're adjacent to the enemy. So if our drow over here was to use their hand crossbow, which is their third weapon, we can actually see here on their character sheet, then <coughs> they would not benefit from the off enemies off guard because that only applies to melee strikes when it comes to flanking. That's rather unfortunate, and that makes ranged weapons which are typically balanced to do about the same damage as, as melee weapons, somewhat less effective. Now, there's also another thing that you need to be worried about. Let's say our giving drow friend is over here and he wants to shoot the enemy with his crossbow. Well, our ally is in the way. So our ally is actually going to provide light cover or, or lesser cover to the enemy, which is going to give them a plus one to their AC. So if you're using a ranged weapon, you have to make sure that you have a clear line of sight to the enemy that does not go through any of your allies' squares. So you can see here, even this one would count as light cover. But if we move just, we move just a little bit further down, I believe this one would, yeah. This one might count as cover. I'm not 100% sure. But I think when it's less than half, it won't count as cover. So this one will not provide cover. There's also a variety of other things you can do with range combat, but we're not going to get super into that. Just know that when you are a ranged character, you need to make sure that your allies are not in your way. So your allies need to make sure they're positioned on the opposite side of the enemy. And you also don't benefit from flanking. Though there are things your allies can do to make it easier for you to hit the enemy. So let's say Vapid Drow over here is being a good teammate and he's going to attempt to grapple. So our, our Vapid Drow over here is going to use the grapple action. And this is going to require an athletics check. Okay, don't put the little chat bubble there. Oh, he rolls in that one. That's super unfortunate. Uh, let's roll again, shall we? Because that... Like, okay, so when you grapple, if you crit fail, you are the one who becomes grabbed or restrained. Or no, sorry, you you drop prone if you make a failed grapple. So that's not really good. Let's, let's roll that again. Let's, let's talk about this. Okay, that's a little bit better. So you can see here grapples go against the enemy's fortitude DC. So we rolled not really well. And you can see here that this is actually considered an attack action. So grapples apply map. But let's say we did manage to grapple the enemy here. So if we give the enemy the grabbed condition. Okay, one second. Let me, let me remove off guard because you can see here it actually gives them off guard and immobilized. So... As we can see, by grabbing the enemy, the enemy is just off guard, and this off guard is not from flanking. This is from our grab. So that being the case, our giving drow over here can fire, and 
benefit from the enemy being off guard, reducing their AC, making it more likely for them to hit. And for our ally here, we can see that they're not super good at grappling. So they might want to do a grapple against their enemy as their first action. And then we can have Vapidrow here, then stab him with his rapier for his second action. That's also going to be a miss. Super unfortunate. But now every other member on this Drow's team can attack and the enemy's AC will be reduced. Meaning that overall, just by grabbing the enemy, you are you likely increase your team's damage by 10%, which is pretty significant depending on the size of your team. And giving up an attack to do so is not always a bad thing, especially if it's something that was not likely to hit anyway. For instance, if you're fighting, like these draw have a pretty significant AC. 18 AC is nothing to sniff at. Their second attack is only at plus four, meaning they need to roll a 14 or higher to even hit. Or they can just gamble on a dice roll. They don't get any benefit from their strength because it's minus five. We can see here that they normally add five. So it's just a straight D20 roll against a Fort DC of 17. But if they do manage to actually grab them on an attack that they would have probably missed anyway, if they do manage to grab them, they increase their whole team damage. So you can see here how just playing teamwork wise in a combat situation can benefit your entire team. There's also tripping the enemy as well, which is also really good because when you trip the enemy, it goes against their reflex DC. So that's something you have to consider. But the enemy will land prone. Now, if we look at the prone condition, which we have up here and drop it on, the enemy becomes off guard and they gain prone. Prone gives the enemy who is currently prone a minus two circumstance penalty to attack rolls. Meaning that if this drow wants to attack on their next turn, they're either going to have to stay vulnerable and take a minus two to hit, or they're going to have to spend one of their three actions to stand up and then make their attack, effectively wasting the enemy's action and making them vulnerable until the enemy gets to act. So each of these two circumstances are beneficial in certain ways. And this is kind of the basics of martial combat. Work as a team, flank when you can, use your skills. Athletics is really good for doing things like tripping or grappling to reduce an enemy's AC for your own attacks or for your allies. And because everyone is kind of very single target damage, working together is very beneficial. In addition to athletic actions, you can also invest in charisma to do things like intimidate. When you intimidate an, an enemy or attempt to demoralize them more rather, you actually give them the frightened condition. So if I go here and I give us the frightened condition, which is this one. So as this enemy is frightened, I love that everything this enemy does is currently reduced. Their AC is reduced. Their fort reflex and will saves are reduced. All of their skills are reduced and even their two hits. We have a plus eight to hit on the first attack, plus three on the second attack and minus two on the third attack. Friend condition is really good and it doesn't come off until the end of the enemy's next turn. And you, ac you can actually get a higher frightened value by either succeed or critically succeeding on a demoralized check, giving you frightened too, which we can see here reduces their stats even further, or a variety of spells. And speaking of spells, let's go ahead and talk about spellcasters. So spellcasters here, we have our drunk vampire master, who's going to be our, our spellcaster for the day. Spellcasters are not designed to do the same effective single target damage as martial characters. Magic char characters have so many tools for different situations inside and outside of combat. They're useful in so many places that if they could do the same single target damage as a ally, as a martial character, then there'd be no reason to play martial characters other than the aesthetic. But even then, you would just be getting outclassed, which wouldn't feel good. So if we take a look here, at our drunken vampire master. He has a list of spells. Let's say that he's going to use. 
color spray. So most spells in the game take two actions. So I said we had three earlier. So two actions mean that the vampire lord doesn't our vampire mastermind does not have a lot of opportunity to do a bunch of things on their turn. But if he runs up here, for instance, and then on his second action uses color spray, which is two actions, so that'd be actually technically his next two actions. We can place our 15 foot cone here. And this is the orthogonal. So you always position from corners or from straight on. This is orthogonal. There's different ways to orientate it, but he's probably going to do something like this, right? So this is a 15 foot cone and spells similar to movement use die uh, use the square circle rule. So you can see here that it goes 5, 15, and then 15 from each. And you always position either directly on in the orthogonal or from the corners for the cones. So <clears throat> just this alone hits both of the two drow here in this corner. So if we make one of them make a will save, for instance, they are going to get a critical fail, mostly because the vampire mastermind is insanely higher level than them, but they're they're going to not do super well. So let's take a look at what the spell does. So if the enemy even just succeeds, if they manage to succeed the check, they still become dazzled. So the dazzled condition here makes everyone concealed. Concealed means they need to make a DC five flat check in order to do anything. So if these drow wanted to retaliate, they would need to make a flat check and need to roll a five or higher. This one is a success. Crit success doesn't do anything on flat checks. So, you know, not bad, but that does reduce the chance of hitting to by 25%, meaning that there's a likelihood that this one spell alone reduced the these two drows damage by 25%, which is pretty significant considering they have a 25% chance of missing. But let's say instead that they fail. Well, they would become stunned one. Stuns, <clears throat> and you can always pause to read these, reduces the number of actions that they would have. So they would become stunned one, which means on their next turn, they would reduce their actions by their stun value, which is one, and then they would only have two actions. Not a super big deal. They could just move and attack or do something like that. But this is in addition to blinded. Now, blinded is a more severe version of concealed, which you would have gotten if they had become dazzled. This gives the enemy a chance to just miss based on a DC 11 flat check. So it doesn't really state here the flat check, but... Uh, every enemy would become hidden to you. And so hidden has a DC 11 flat check. So if we rolled another, just another D20. That's another hit. That's right. Super, super lucky by them. I can't even. But let's go ahead and say, there you go. So that would be a miss. You have a 50% chance of missing, which means that if both of these two drow failed the color spray, the the vampire master would have effectively reduced their damage by a whole 50% for one round, which is pretty good. Now, since they critically failed, they would be stunned for one round. So when stunned is followed by a round value, so if it has an amount of time that is like a, a number of time, they lose all action. So they would have lost all their actions on their next round. And they would have been blinded for a minute. So effectively for the combat, this vampire mastermind reduced these two drows overall effectiveness by one round and 50% of all future damage that they do. That is a very significant amount of effect from just two actions. And if the other drow had been in this area, he could have hit all three of them. But in this configuration, right? Maybe color spray isn't what we want to do. Maybe maybe there's another action we can do that might be more effective. So if our vampire mastermind was to go over here and say use a fireball. All right, here we go. I had to make a new vampire mastermind. This is the easy going one. I missed the drunk one. That was funnier. Uh, but he has fireball, right? So he's going to cast fireball. And we can see here that this one has a 20 foot burst, which if we place this on the map, 
This is a pretty significant size. So easy, or so big, in fact, that it can hit all of the drow that we have. So we center it on a vertex here, and we get a cool fire effect because we're using foundry, and it's really, really fun. And so now all the drow in this circle will need to make a reflex saving throw. If we were to do this, that's a critical failure. So if we roll the damage for our fireball, that's 18. Since it's a critical failure on the spell, and this is a spell that is a basic saving throw, I'll say basic here, that means on a critical fail, they'll actually take double damage. So, you know, 18 times two, I mean, if we hit the double marker here, that's 36 damage, a very significant amount of damage that they have taken from that particular blow. But let's say that they just, they succeeded the check. All three somehow miraculously managed to succeed the check. Well, they would each take half damage, which is nine in this situation. So each of these guys taking nine damage means that this one fireball, even though all the enemies succeeded their saves, dealt 27 damage. That is really significant. And that shows that if there were more enemies here, the, the damage is multiplied by the number of enemies in the circle. And on average, if you're hitting a weak save, for them, reflex is their good save. But if this was their weak save, you're likely to do your damage to every target, which can make a spellcaster do more damage than a single target marshal. But let's go ahead and say that our vampire lord here, our vampire mastermind, uh, decided that he didn't want to do that. And instead, he wanted to just come up and strike our philosophical drow because he's an asshole. So he's going to strike with his weapon here. And he's going to hit because he's a higher level. Now, if we roll our damage, we can see that he rolled 15 damage. Now, this is less damage than he rolled for the fireball, but this strike was only a singular action. So if he was to strike again with his second action, which would then match the number of actions of fireball. Oh, he's going to crit and he's going to do a bunch of damage. Let's say he just hit. For, for all intents and purposes, like the average intended, that's 17 damage. So 17 plus 15 is going to be 32, I believe, right? 5, 7 is 12, yeah. 32 damage, which is pretty substantial, nearly twice the damage of our fireball to the enemy. Granted, because we hit all three of the enemies, let's say with a full fireball. Our fireball did, let's see here, that would be 36 plus 18, which is 54. 54 damage with two actions versus single target damage of 32. So, considering multiple targets are available, fireball is more effective at, at hitting multiple enemies. Now, obviously, that's not always going to be the case. Maybe your allies are interspersed in here. But you can see here how spellcasters can easily do more damage given the right situation. But if you're fighting against a boss or enemies that have particularly good saves, well, you know, spellcasters do suffer in that regard somewhat. But that doesn't mean that what they do is any less effective. Like I said, color spray, even just when the enemy succeeds, does something. The fireball that we would do would still do half damage to the boss enemy. In fact, it's insanely hard for spellcasters to do nothing in their turn unless an enemy critically succeeds. And this is where the the this is where we kind of break down to the basics of the game. Do you want to play a more actiony high pace, you know, martial character? A martial character gets to like run in, trip the enemy, punch him in the face. Very action-y, very high impact. And in fact, most marshals get actions that increase their efficiency to make it even better. Like this drow could run in and have dual-wield weapons, double slice for a single action, and then slice one more time with a third action, making them essentially do four actions in the space of three actions. 
That's a lot, and it feels very impactful, depending on the use of feats, of course. Spellcasters are much more methodical. They have to decide what they're going to do, and their turns are a little bit more restricted. They have to, you know, they can move, or they can use a, some kind of spell shape in and cast a spell every round, and that's what you're going to be doing every round. But, as I showed earlier, it's all about finding the situation. If you enjoy looking at the battlefield and trying to maximize effectiveness, spellcasting might be for you. Because, as I said, even though the marshals are doing much more damage in a shorter uh, amount of time, the spellcaster can do more damage to the battlefield overall and outpace the damage of the marshals depending on the number of enemies. And even if that's not the case, the spellcaster can insanely reduce the enemy team's effectiveness by using things like color spray or ray of enfeeblement or whatever that just nerf the enemies, pretty much reducing their levels and making it much easier for their teammates to, you know, win the day. And the great thing is, is that for most spellcaster abilities, so even the ones that do damage also do something in addition. So our fireball wasn't a very good example of that because it's just a big area effect. So it doesn't do extra things. I don't think the vampire has anything in particular that does. Okay, let's look at Phantasmal Killer, for instance. So Phantasmal Killer not only does 4d6 mental damage, or I guess 8d6 at this level, which 32, that's a pretty amount, though only to a singular target. Uh, they also, even if the enemy succeeds, they would still take half the damage, or they'd roll 4d6, and they would get the Frightened 1 condition, which I told you before, reduces all their other saves. And if they fail, they do the full damage, and the enemy becomes Frightened too. And we can just see here with 8d6, that was actually an insanely good roll. There's a lot of <clears throat> decent dice there. We have a lot of effectiveness that our spellcasters can do. So hopefully this video orchestrated for you the basics of combat, what you can do to make the combat easier by something just as simple as using flanking with your allies, which flanking doesn't require any check. Any enemy really can be flanked unless they have a specific thing that says that they can't be flanked. And it's an easy way to essentially knock the enemy's defenses down by essentially one to two levels as far as like game balance is concerned. And in addition, hopefully you guys got to see the difference between marshals and spellcasters. So that's gonna be it for me. This is my first attempt at a video like this. So hopefully I can refine it more, but if this was helpful to you, please leave a like so other people get a chance to see this video and subscribe if you wanna see more. I'm gonna be doing videos like this for other game systems other than Pathfinder 2nd Edition and as well other kind of player aids for other games or GM aids for if you want to run a game yourself. But that's going to be it for me. Thank you all so much for watching. Good luck with your games. Leave the bad luck to me, and I'll see you all next time. Bye.